Welcome everyone to the January 2022 Essex County Field Naturalist Club uh, members meeting, first one of the year. Welcome everybody, happy new year. Hope everyone had a safe and happy holiday season. Uh, looking forward to getting back to these meetings now. Tonight, uh, we have a special guest that uh, also happens to be the club, uh, club president. And uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest presenter, Karen Alexander. Uh, she is the policy coordinator with the Invasive Species Center. And uh, like I'd mentioned, she's also our club president. Karen has over a decade of experience with invasive species in Ontario and the Great Lakes. Most of her experience is with Phragmites, but in her new role with the ISC, she's gaining knowledge about many other aggressive invasive species that threaten Canadian ecosystems and our economy. Uh, so Karen is happy to share some of her updates and information with the club tonight. So without yes. further ado, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Corey, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so yeah, tonight I'm just gonna talk to you about invasive species. And I think I <clears throat> wanted to start by saying I'm, I'm somewhat new to my role with Invasive Species Center. I just started the job about six months ago. So I'm uh, learning a lot as I go. Um, I have quite a, an extensive background with Phragmites, having started to um, working with that species, I think back in like 2011, was my first uh, Phragmites control project on Lake Huron shore and um, went on to do numerous things over the years to support that uh, management of Phragmites in Ontario. So, you know, a lot of the species that I work on at in my new role are, are new to me. So it's kind of exciting to have an opportunity to kind of dig into some of them a little bit to prepare for this presentation. So it is the first time I deliver this presentation. So, um, you know, we're going to go through it for the first time together. So <laughs> here's the, uh, like we always like to do some um, a First Nation um, recognition. Um, the ISC actually is up in Sault Ste. Marie. And um, we like to acknowledge that the organization um, is on traditional territory of the Anishinaabe's people in the Robeson Huron Treaty area. And we recognize the long history of Indigenous and Métis people in this area and across Canada and want to show respect to them and demonstrate our gratitude for their ongoing care of the land and water. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Invasive Species Centre, it's a nonprofit organization. Um, it is registered in Canada, uh, and it's an organization that's about 10 years old now. Um, we're, we're almost into our 11th year. So it's not a, a really old organization, but has um, focuses on connecting stakeholders, knowledge, and technology. And the, the main mission is to just prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species, um, particularly those that harm Canada, Canada's environment, economy, and society. So that's our website there. It's uh, really full of a ton of great resources and I encourage you to check it out if you have some time. So tonight I just wanted to go through a few things with you. I think, um, you know, just a high level, what is an invasive species, just a few slides on that. Um, talking a little bit about how they spread. Uh, and then because we're a naturalist club and a lot of us spend a lot of time outside um, in our natural areas, I put together a bit of a watch list for Essex County specifically. So, you know, what species um, are coming, potentially coming next, that we really don't want here. And some that are, you know, maybe just arriving and, and maybe we could um, be reporting some of those observations if we see any uh, when mm -hmm. we're out and about. Um, and I do want to explain a little bit about what happens on the other side of these reports, because I don't know if, um, everyone is really aware of that. And I think it's a powerful tool, um, citizen sciences anyway. And um, then talk about some other ways that we as club members might be able to help protect Canada from some of the uh, really aggressive species coming our way. And obviously we like to end with some healthy discussion and questions. So we'll start with um, you know, the, the basics here. Um, an invasive species is an organism that is introduced outside of its range and it causes harm within that introduced range. So non-native species 
are really only considered a bit invasive when they achieve that impact to ecology, economy, or society. That second part's really important. Um, they, um, a lot of non-native species that we have in Canada aren't considered invasive because they don't actually cause those impacts to um, negative impacts to ecology, economy, or society. Um, and invasive species tend to share, like the aggressive ones tend to share um, many of the same characteristics. Uh, most of them are very fast growing. They lack natural predators and target native species that often lack defense mechanisms. They just haven't evolved in the presence of these new species in these ecosystems. So they just don't have the ability to um, withstand some of the, the competitive characteristics these species have. Um, other characteristics, uh, they often have multiple ways of reproducing. So they often um, either uh, have seeds, they reproduce by plant fragments, um, and they ha they're really good at getting around. Um, and, it, and all of these characteristics combined give them that competitive edge. So when they do arrive in a system that is outside of their normal range, um, it, they can quickly dominate and cause a negative impact. And invasive species um, have been moving, well, humans have been moving species around the planet for hundreds of years, like we, we all know that, but the process has, you know, the, in, the movement of invasive species that are causing issues, um, ha, like that process has been pretty slow. Um, recently, more recently with the um, increase in modern trade, travel, technology, these biological invasions that are causing severe economic and, and environmental impacts are, are increasing. So these um, invasions are now becoming a consequence of, of globalization. And some of the pathways of spread, um, these uh, are linked to these uh, trade and commerce. And, and we really can't shut these pathways down because they are really connected to our economy. So, um, we do need to identify these pathways when we talk about invasive species uh, in order to prevent them from entering new areas, but also addressing the spread once they're here so we can properly contain and potentially eradicate. Um, prevention is the best way to stop the spread of invasive species. Um, so when you look at some of these really common pathways on the screen, you know, some of the opportunities to intercept these pathways kind of come to mind, um, like cleaning equipment, uh, recreational boats, um, even using brush stations at trailheads um, are really good ways to kind of intercept that pathway and stop the spread. Um, we've all, I'm sure maybe many of us are aware of some of the ballast water policies that have come into play in the last decade to protect the Great Lakes from an increasing number of aquatic invasive species that were traced back to ballast water. So they said, okay, we have to intercept that pathway and made more policies to, to stop the um, st stop these ships from releasing that ballast water in the Great Lakes. So there's all these different ways that you can intercept these pathways. And when we talk about um, prevention, that, that's really what we're, we're talking about. And that prevention is, is really important when we talk about yeah. invasive species and where to invest our money. Um, so this curve is something we use at the ISC quite a bit to try to communicate um, why investment in prevention and eradication is so important. And um, what, what we're trying to show here is if you can invest $1 in prevention, you're going to gain 100 back in, in um, protecting the negative impacts that that species might cause to your economy and, and environment. Um, this invasion curve, um, it's sorry, it's called the invasion curve. Um, so what it's showing is as the cost of control increases, the economic damages avoided um, decrease. So what's you have these stages of invasion going on and you have the, the opportunity to prevent it from arriving. And then you have, if it does arrive, you have an opportunity to eradicate it immediately so that it doesn't continue to establish and achieve what they call this containment phase where, okay, the species is here, it's expanding, it's establishing, we know how it's spreading, so let's intercept those pathways and contain it. Um, and then eventually maybe you can keep fighting it back and, and, and eradicate it. 
Um, if you miss that opportunity in all cases, then it moves on and becomes an established population on the landscape or in the uh, ecosystem, like in a, a river or the lake. And the, the management and investment money has to move from catch, prevent, contain to long-term management and control. And sometimes you get to the point where you're no longer even managing the infestation, you're managing the impact. Um, and you know, some examples might be zebra mussel, lamprey, um, phragmites in some places in Ontario has gotten to the point where it, it's really just managing the impacts of the species um, and eradication is becoming harder and harder to imagine. Uh, if not, maybe never. We just have to accept that they're here now. Um, and then that box on the side I wanted to bring up because it's a staggering number when you think about the potential impacts of invasive species coming in to Ontario um, as a total of $3.6 billion a year, which is a, a significant hit to our, uh, our way of life. So we do want to, what did I want to say at the end here? We wanted to, we want to always be focusing on prevention so that we don't have to deal with these long-term impacts that do impact our economy. And oops, I didn't realize that was going to pop up. So there is investment going on. Um, this is just another slide and another way to look at that where we see prevention, detection, and control and management investments in municipalities in Ontario. So this is, um, the ISC does these surveys of municipalities and conservation authorities. Um, they've done a few over the last few years. And this one, this slide kind of summarizes the 2018 results. And what it's showing is investment into management and control. Um, what the, the circle chart on the side is showing is the majority of the money that municipalities use in their budget is all about control and management. Um, detection, very small component of the budget. And again, prevention is, is small too. So if we can, you know, what's happening is it's easy to see when all, all these species are coming in, uh, land managers are, are overwhelmed. They are struggling to manage the impacts of the ones that are here and there's minimal amounts left to say, okay, let's invest in prevention and detection as well. So it's just an interesting story. There's a lot of information on this slide. And, you know, we're looking back in 2018, Emerald Ash Bore um, was a high priority and had significant investment from our local municipalities and conservation authorities. Phragmites has been near the top five in the last few years of this survey. Um, you can get past year results on our website, by the way. This is just one summary slide that I thought was nice. Um, giant hogweed, um, 2019 results, you'll see the um, uh, gypsy moth come in uh, second place. So it, it, it came in and just required a significant amount of money um, to manage. So I think, you know, the, the, the take home message in these last few slides is that prevention is key. And so I thought um, we could talk a little bit about what the club could do to help prevent invasive species. Um, and the biggest thing that we could do is basically report anything we see when we're out there. Um, so I, I mean, we could talk for all night about some of the invasive species um, in Essex County, but also maybe coming our way. But what I did is I, I used um, an online application called EdMaps. And this is a, um, it's kind of like iNaturalist, but specifically for invasive species. And it's, so it, what it provides maps of um, where observations have been logged and it kind of compiles observations from professionals and citizen scientists. So it's kind of considered like a pretty great spot to go and see what invasive species are near you, what ones are around you and what ones might be coming into your area next. So I used that system and talked to some of my colleagues and put together a, a watch for list in Essex County that um, I'd like to go through now. Um, and then once we're done that, I'll talk again about EdMaps a little more and um, what happens with the data on the other side if some of these um, species that are reported in Essex County.
So the first one, um, I think maybe some of us may have heard of oak wilt by now. Um, this is a vascular disease. Um, it's a, caused by a fungus, uh, a Brettvelia fagacearium. I don't know if I say that properly, but oak wilt is a, actually a regulated species um, under the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And that's because it, it's, a, it's a scary one. Um, the economic impacts of oak wilt are enormous. Some of the uh, estimates are preliminarily set at $66.5 million in the GTA alone is what it might cost if, if this species is um, unmanaged and allowed to take off in Ontario. Uh, we stand to, it, it, it actually, um, we stand to pay, potentially lose all our oak species to this uh, fungus, but red oak are slightly more susceptible. Um, what happens is it causes a wilting and bronzing of the foliage starting at the top of the tree and then it moves down and you end up seeing this discoloration of the leaves and uh, premature leaf fall. Um, and then you'll also see these white, gray or black fungal mats uh, form on the bark. And these are what they call pressure pads. And they, they often sometimes emit a fruity smell. Uh, and then around that, you'll see these vertical bark cracks. Um, negative impacts are, like I said, enormous for the economy. Um, also aesthetics of neighborhoods, loss of shade and wildlife habitat. Um, I think it was one of the speakers at our speaker series years ago that I went home not knowing and learning that night that the oak tree provides the most habitat for wildlife and other species of all our trees. So, you know, the, the economic or the ecological impacts um, are enormous too. Um, so oak wilt is close. Uh, it's, I actually switched the mapping for this slide because this map is far more accurate and how close it is to Windsor, um, 574 meters away. Um, and in 2021, as of 2021, we haven't found it yet in Canada, but the CFIA is watching very closely this species and they did confirm eDNA in 2019 in beetle traps, but that does not mean that it's here. They would need to first find a uh, and confirm a symptomatic tree. So they're still hoping the beetles may have just blown in on the wind, but they're, they are watching closely the oak trees in Windsor. Um, the city of Windsor actually has an oak wilt prevention program that includes uh, training for employees and um, other, me other methods to help prevent the establishment of oak wilt in, in Ontario. Um, so this is one that we could all be outside looking for. Um, the pathways of spread do limit its ability to move long distances. Um, what it does is uh, the sporulating mats um, between the sapwood and bark attract those sap beetles. Um, and then they, they, the, the insects move um, and get carried in the wind. So they, they do have a little bit of a limited ability to spread. Um, but they also, once established in an area, uh, the fungus spreads underground. Um, so it'll go from one infected tree to the other uh, underground in the root networks, which is kind of scary because then all your root, all your oaks around the original sick tree start getting, getting sick pretty quickly. So one of the control methods is they use um, big <clears throat> ground saws and they actually create trenches and cut the roots and, and just isolate that infestation. So um, that's oak wilt. <laughs> the next species is um, spotted lanternfly. This one is uh, coming potentially to Ontario next. It's not here yet either, but it's uh, on the watch list. Um, it's native to Southeastern Asia and um, adults mainly feed on the tree of heaven, which is another invasive species that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but it will occasionally, um, the adults will occasionally feed on weeping willow uh, as well. Uh, the nymphs will feed on hardwood trees. And this is where this species gets a bit scary because it feeds on um, up to 70 different hardwood types, hardwood trees and fruit trees. Um, grapevines are a preferred host of the nymph uh, stage. And in uh, Pennsylvania, where this uh, things first showed up, uh, vineyards have been decimated. Um, and when we look to uh, Ontario's wine industry um, at 6.8 billion, 
um, and the tender fruit industry coming in around 43 million, we it's not hard to imagine the impacts this species could have if it arrives here and is undetected and, and, it's, and establishes. Uh, so this species, what you look for um, year round, they go through uh, like the stages of insects. So they hatch in May um, and go through four instart stages. So the black, the black one is what it looks like first. Um, and by the time it hits its fourth instar, it looks like the smaller red one beside it starts to have the red color with the white dots and the black. Um, the adults appear in July. Um, and they do have wings, but they don't fly that well. They actually hop and uh, use the wings to kind of navigate where they're going next. Um, the adults will congregate on the trees, uh, like in the image on the screen. So you, if you don't usually just see one, you're gonna see a, a bunch of them. Um, and they like to uh, use their mouth parts to pierce the, the tree and they drink the tree sap. Uh, and what they do is they, they kind of excrete this um, sticky honeydew, it's called. So you'll also see that honeydew mold over time. So in a really infested tree, you'll start to see this black mold appear on the, on the bark of the tree. Um, and then other insects get attracted to this because it smells and uh, they get stuck in there. So it's not good for our native insects either. The other, uh, the last bit that we could be watching for, and I would imagine the most important part because what that that image there on the far right is the egg mass. So they lay these egg masses and it kind of appears um, white at first and then it kind of slowly dries into this gray cracked mud appearance. And they'll lay these eggs on um, uh, outdoor furniture, um, like wooden uh, wood, they'll lay it on trees. So um, it's been, uh, caught moving in the U.S. Uh, on shipments of outdoor furniture. So that, that's one way that it could arrive in Canada. Um, but the good news is the adults don't overwinter. So they, they do die and then the eggs, they, they lay their eggs late in the year and then the eggs hatch in May. So the, the opportunity to catch this thing, if, if you can remove the eggs and destroy them, you're, you're, you have the ability to stop the impacts of the nymphs to our, our economy. Um, and here's the map of its distribution. Um, it first established in Pennsylvania, and I'm not sure why, yeah, there it is in the, in the Pennsylvania state, um, in 2014. And as of 2020, they've uh, intercepted it as far north as New York and Ohio. We even had one report in Chatham-Kent that turned out to be negative but it was um, taken very seriously and um, it, it was uh, confirmed negative within a few days. Uh, this is a huge threat to our uh, agriculture industry. So they are watching for these reports to come in. Um, in Pennsylvania, they, uh, like I said, had a decimation of some of the, the wineries there and they've um, identified it as an incredibly significant threat to their agriculture industry and have this species under quarantine order. Um, it's not yet detected in Ontario, but the Niagara region is on very high alert. Um, and the Invasive Species Center is working on education programs to train um, people in the winery and fruit industry so that they can remove the egg masses, destroy them and ensure that uh, they don't emerge in the spring. Um, but this really only works if you have people in the ground uh, watching and um, reporting and uh, learning how to destroy the egg masses properly. The next uh, species is water soldier. Uh, this one is kind of a, a backward story because it, it started in Ontario <laughs> and is now moving south. So I'll show you the map in a minute, but it's native to Europe and Northwest Asia. And this one is a submerged perennial aquatic plant. So it's uh, buoyant in the summer months. And as the leaves mature, they get waterlogged and the plant sinks. Um, so it looks a lot like aloe, um, even like a spider plant that you would see in your house um, or even like the top of a pineapple. Um, and it, it looks a lot like some of our native species out there, uh, burrweed, uh, arrowhead and eelgrass has been mistakenly identified as water soldier. 
um, in Ontario, it actually rarely produces flower. And there's that one image of the flower there with the Ducks Unlimited reference that you can just barely see. But when it does produce flower, it's just a small three petal white flower. Um, in Ontario, it is more uh, predominantly um, expanding by vegetation. Uh, it's like um, predominantly by offsets. Uh, if you're familiar with the house plant, the spider plant, um, it sends those offsets out and it, it's a clone of the, the original plant, just smaller versions of it. Um, and that's predominantly how it's reproducing in Ontario. So, so these leaves are long and uh, thin, but they have really sharp serrated edges, um, really sharp that it, they can cut right through human skin. So it's uh, a threat to our swimming um, and our ability to recreate in shorelines and uh, waterways. Um, can also cause some pretty significant impacts to property, commercial fishing industry, and it even damages boat motors. So that's not very good for the recreational boating uh, industry in uh, our area. Um, so here's the map. This one uh, started in North America and Ontario in the Trent River system. Um, and it, Canada is uh, taking this one really seriously as well monitoring the spread and doing a number of things to try to bring it under control. Um, so it's a localized spread. It's making some long distance jumps recently, as you can see, and making its way south to uh, Essex. So one to definitely be keeping an eye out if you're a paddler or you spend a lot of time around water, um, you know, keeping just an eye out for this species and then reporting anything you think might uh, be water soldier would be hugely helpful for, for our region. Um, the MNR and the OFAH are leading this program and put significant investment in monitoring and uh, control efforts um, to try to bring this uh, invasion under control. Um, okay, and then pathways of spread like uh, water, watercraft and associated equipment, trailers. Um, so intercepting these things, the, these pathways, a lot of the, the effort the OFAH puts is into education to help people who recreate in these waterways, particularly with small boats, moving from one place to the other, they're able to uh, learn how to clean their boat and watch for the, like if they're moving um, plants from one, one waterway to the other. European water chestnut, um, native to Europe, Asia and Africa is a, restricted species in Ontario. Um, actually, as of January 1st, 2022, it's a newly listed one. Um, it likes lakes, rivers, streams, uh, soft scrub substrate, and uh, really nutrient rich waters, which we have a lot of around here. Um, shallow lakes with shallow deep water and um, has these floating leaves that grow in this circular bunch. Um, and it, it makes like a densely crowded row set. Um, the leaves are, are, you know, 15 centimeters long with this spongy swollen section or segments. Um, and then these underwater leaves. So what you see above, it's like a floating mat. And then the stems go down to the seed and the substrate. And along that stem, they have these extending uh, leaves. And it really what's happening is you get this huge dense underwater mat. Um, so thick sometimes that you could almost step on it and you're not going to sink. So it's just this pile of vegetation um, and it's an annual. So it'll die in the fall. And when it dies, it decomposes and the decomposition takes out all the oxygen in the water. And what happens is the fish habitats destroyed. Um, and you end up uh, actually in the U S where this thing's gotten really bad. They've documented what they call um, a smorgasbord for the predator fish that hang out around the edges of these mats and all the small fish come out because they need oxygen and then they just get annihilated. So they call it this like smorgasbord for predator fish. Um, the nuts there, that seed is super sharp and they kind of cover the bottom and you end up uh, stepping on them or it can inhibit uh, the opportunity to, to recreate uh, as well. So that one is really bad in the States and is coming across um, toward our uh, Southwest Ontario region. 
it has showed up in Eastern Ontario and um, in the Belleville area, Kingston, these areas where it is in Ontario, there's significant investment to try to stop it by the MNR. Um, and Ducks Unlimited is working hard. Um, there's a uh, provincial park, I'm forgetting the name of it at the moment, that is heavily invested um, in managing the uh, infestation in, I think it's in the Belleville area. But um, we've, as in Ontario, we've um, come up with excellent ways to control it. And the, the thing is about this plant is that it is an annual. So it's one of those species that you can eradicate with repeat control to stop the seeds. So what they found at Ontario Parks found after just four years of repeat removing, the vi seed viability dropped by something like 90%. So there, this is one of those species that is bad, but it also offers a really unique opportunity to eradicate it um, with the right resources and the, and the right uh, early detection programs. Um, the ISC is actually involved in this species. Um, in Niagara region, there was three EDMAPS reports come in in 2020, um, and they were all in the same stretch of the Welland River. So we went out and paddled it and found the infestation and said, hey, we can get on top of this. So we've actually put in for some funding to uh, support a de early detection rapid response program to remove it from uh, Southwest Ontario. Um, so that, that's a good news story. I feel like I was just talking about such um, large threats that I wanted to just stop and say, you know, there is a lot of effort to stop these plants from getting into, into the province. And this is a, one of those stories. Um, Tree of Heaven. This is a uh, pretty cool plant. <laughs> I mean, it's not because it's invasive and it does bad things, but it uh, is like the fastest growing tree um, in North America. It can grow up rapidly, like up to 30 meters in height uh, within a couple of years. Um, and they nickname it stinking sumac because it will release this really foul smell when crushed. Um, it can look a lot like black walnut, staghorn, sumac, and ash. But the difference um, is in the, the leaves there where you have this like little lip at the bottom that the um, other native species wouldn't have. Um, and it has this really pretty flowering uh, cluster that, um, sorry, I have notes. I don't, I'm learning as I go um, for some of these species. So the leaves are large and they have these glandular teeth at their base. Um, which the, the lookalikes wouldn't have. Um, twigs are hairless, greenish pink, reddish or brown, and the bark is thin and then gets really thick as the tree matures. And then the flowers are small and pale yellow to green um, with this pinkish color coming in when they mature. So the tree of heaven uh, is a problem because it can destroy infrastructure and it's actually a human health risk that causes uh, dermatitis and um, very rarely myocarditis if it enters the bloodstream. So uh, if you do see this tree out there, just be aware that it might uh, irritate your skin if you get a little close. And tree of heaven is everywhere, and it's but it's not quite yet in Ontario. Um, it, it's bad in the Toronto area and uh, London, but down in our area, it's um, just getting going. So there is an opportunity to potentially contain it I kind of zoomed in on Essex here to give us a better look. Um, it's showing up, uh, you know, in various places around the county. But this is, would be what I would call an opportunity to um, contain the spread and, and potentially eradicate. Um, and there is a biocontrol that's coming um, potentially for Tree of Heaven, which is another um, positive uh, potential help coming our way. It's a fungus called Verticulium non-alfalfa. And it's kind of an interesting story because it was discovered kind of by happenstance in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, and it, they think it was, um, they think it's a soil boiling fungus that is actually native to our Eastern forest. And it is um, causing uh, death and like it's killing tree of heaven by the thousands. 
So it, they're looking more into it as a potential tool to bring Tree of Heaven under control in North America. So that's good news too. Um, dog strangling vine. This is another restricted species in Ontario, native to Eurasia, was introduced um, in Northeastern USA for gardening. And it uh, is a huge threat to our alvars and tall grass berries and savannas. This one you might hear a lot about um, from nature clubs in the Toronto area, uh, a lot of uh, effort into fighting back this species uh, in the Rouge Valley. Um, stems are downy and they can twine and climb and they grow upright and eventually they bend under their own weight. So they can bring down, you know, trees and, and uh, smaller vegetable shrubs and things. It fruits in late July and the fruit is these long pods that look um, pod-like at each leaf, four to seven centimeters long and they contain this milky sap. Um, and it flowers in late June and July and the flowers are there on the screen. Clusters of, uh, and they look like clusters of red, brownish, pink uh, and five petals. So that, that's what the, the dog strangling vine looks like. Um, and it, it's not a good one. Uh, it can harm the economy because it'll move into corn and soybean fields. It's toxic to livestock. Um, this thing has short-circuited electric fences, which aren't cheap to replace. Um, causes, uh, increases cost in reforestation and it'll even affect the Christmas trees, farms and nurseries. Um, there's been stories of uh, domestic dogs getting tangled up in the vines. Um, people can't use trails and they just become impenetrable mats, as you can see on that large picture on the screen. Uh, and then obviously the ecological impacts are significant. This one is a specific threat to our monarch butterfly um, who that has been documented mistaking this plant for milkweed. Um, and then the, the, the eggs hatch and, and they're on the wrong plant and they don't survive. Um, and uh, deer avoid DSV, um, which could increase the impacts of deer on other native vegetation around the area that dog strangling vine exists. Um, here's the map of DSV uh, in EdMaps anyway. So they said it's pretty bad in the GTA in Eastern Ontario, but it's just getting going down here in Southwest Ontario. So it's another one of those species that we as a club could be, you know, really cognizant of and, um, you know, doing what we can to, to report those species and, and potentially even learning how to, to remove it and, and get it, get it gone if we see it um, out there. Uh, you know, that would involve getting permissions to do so, but sometimes it's um, worthwhile to stop this thing from establishing down here. DSB was first found in Ontario way back in the late 1800s and um, has been moving around since. Local distribution often occurs when people move the plant, um, gardening or accidentally carrying those seeds, buds, they can attach to boots and equipment. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a new species in Essex. Um, actually, I think I zoomed in on Essex for this one too. There's, there's just a few, there's three in our county. Um, two of these observations were made in 2017 or sorry, one in 2017 and two in 2019. So, so pretty darn early uh, opportunity to eradicate it from Essex. And the infamous frag. <laughs> this one deserved a slide because it's so terrible. Um, we see it everywhere in Essex, perhaps probably one of the worst um, here. It's established everywhere, spreads along shorelines, up and down watersheds railroads, trails, roads, drains. Um, and there's a lot of attention on this species right now in Ontario. Um, there, in fact, they did update the uh, best management practices uh, in 2021. So in the last decade, we've learned a lot in Ontario about how to manage Phragmites. Um, a, um, a lot of manual control techniques have come in because the uh, province hasn't had access to a water safe herbicide. Um, it has just been registered um, in 2020 and is you know, rather expensive, but it, it, it's available now. But manual control has proven effective and where you can avoid using a herbicide, you, you, you might as well. So there's um, 
a new opportunities for integrated pest management for Phragmites that combines a number of tools that uh, is proving effective in many communities in the province. And um, I have a slide later in the presentation, but I might as well mention that we, our club, uh, the, the Field Naturalist Club has started a FRAG committee. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about what we hope to achieve and, and get going with, um, please contact uh, me or Heather Inksetter who's on the call tonight. And I think Aileen's here too. Um, and that's our, our committee of three and we have a few people interested to join us. So uh, we hope to kind of build some awareness, educate some of our members on some of those uh, emerging manual control techniques and help um, help landowners and, and maybe club members who have this on their property, bring it under control. Um, start small like that and, and then potentially be able to branch out and help some of the larger control projects going on in the county um, as we grow. So anyway, that was a divergent piece of the presentation, but Frag here is uh, costing the economy. Um, I think the recent cost benefit analysis put the cost of control around 300 and something million if we were to say go and eradicate all the frag in Ontario overnight. Um, but the benefit, sorry, the cost is about 109 million. The benefits are over 300 million if we were to do that um, because the costs are so significant. Um, you can trace this thing to having costs all the way down to like um, causing car accidents on, in, on roadsides, um, fire hazards, uh, reduced visibility property values. Um, the estimate number for just uh, shoreline property and the reduced value in Ontario is around $357 million of lost property value because of Pragmites um, causing shoreline issues. So it's a big one for the economy. And then obviously social risks and or impacts and then ecology impacts. Um, I think there's 25 species at risk that specifically have Phragmites as a threat in their recovery strategies. So it's a big one. Um, and um, where am I at here? Ontario municipalities spend 2.8 million per year on Frag. Um, that's the number that we have right now. Um, and that's just to control the impacts. In most cases, many municipalities are struggling to imagine to bring this thing under control. Um, and here's the map. So you can see that it is um, across Ontario and moving north. Um, actually, it, it was off the map. I just had to kind of zoom in into our area. It is moving across northern uh, Lake Superior right now and um, has arrived, I think, in Manitoba. I think they have it in Alberta now. And uh, it's been in BC for a while. And BC immediately made it a restricted species. So they are on it, um, making sure it doesn't get fully established. Um, and yeah, that's the Phragmites. Um, it, it's using corridors, mostly roads are roadways to move north. Um, and then once it gets established on the roadside, it kind of moves into the, the wetlands adjacent and then goes from there. Um, that's a pattern you can see going up the Bruce, the round Georgian Bay, uh, the lake here on shoreline, that pattern existed years ago where it would be on the highway 21 and then it would show up on the shoreline at the water, waterway outlets, in the drains, and then expand from there. So it's pretty um, obvious how it's moving around. Clean equipment protocol is a big one to stop this, this spread. Um, and that's uh, growing in popularity as people start to um, use that, those guidelines more and more. I could probably talk about Phragmites all night, so I will move on to um, European frogbit. And this is another aquatic invasive species. Um, it is also restricted in Ontario as of January 1st, 2022. Um, it's from Europe and parts of Asia and Africa. And it's a free floating, it can be free floating or it roots in shallow water. Really loves slow moving water, ponds, slow moving rivers, ditches. Leaves are small, two and a half to five centimeters wide, looks like a round heart shape, um, and they form a, a rosette up to six centimeters wide. The flowers are singular and up to two centimeters wide with three rounded petals and this uh, little yellow center. 
Um, and then the leaf bottom is a uh, purple red with a spongy coating along the middle vein leaf. Um, so it can look a lot like some of the lily pads, but some of those characteristics are distinguish, help you distinguish what uh, frog bit um, looks, or what, that it's frog bit. Um, and this one has the ability to clog drains, ditches, impacts recreation tourism, uh, hinders our ability to use aquatic areas for swimming, boating, recreational fishing impacts. Um, and then uh, the ecological uh, impacts are quite similar to some of the species we've talked about already, um, creating those anoxic conditions in the water, uh, causing fish habitat and fish die-offs, and uh, just crowding out all our native species. So the map of Frogbit is, um, you know, not good either, <laughs> but, and it's here in Essex County, it's a, you know, there's 55 EDMAPS observations in the Point Pelee National Park area, um, and then 10 up in the Lake, uh, Lake St. Clair shore, uh, and then seven down the Big Creek Way. So it is here, um, and I just, I put that, this one in because it, it's still not a fully established in our county. So I think we can be watching for it. Um, and I also think European frogbit is an interesting species because I am, when many frag control projects get going and remove Phragmites, what comes back is frogbit. Um, in some places where this species has gotten really bad in the States. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind when you have multiple invasive species going on. If you're trying to fight one, you kind of have to put resources in another to actually gain your ecosystem back. Um, so it's important to kind of not turn your eye to some of these other ones as we focus on, on one or, or the other. Um, okay, and then the last species I wanted to highlight tonight was Japanese knot, is Japanese knotweed. Um, also a restricted, newly restricted species in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> this one was brought in as a horticulture plant in the late 19th century. And it grows in now wide range of habitats, but it really loves the riparian areas. As you can see in the image, this is what it'll do to waterways um, and, and ditches and riparian features. And it, it's really bad at holding soil. So the roots are super weak. So it'll dominate the riparian section and, and out compete our native species with deeper roots and then completely destabilize the banks and create erosion problems. Um, and it also has this incredible ability to grow right through concrete asphalt buildings. Um, in uh, Europe, it, it, you're not allowed to have this species anywhere near infrastructure because of the do well-documented impacts of it destroying like foundations, right? So it, it's a pretty uh, aggressive species. Um, it it kind of looks like bamboo, grows um, these thick stalks um, that stand dead over the winter. Um, and they're hollow and they have this purple to green color. Um, the flowers appear in July or August and they're like small white green. Uh, and knotweeds kind of have this distinguishing look where the, the stalk kind of has these no nodes and it kind of zigzags a bit. And then you get these, these leaves that, leaves are alternate uh, coming off that stem. Uh, once you see it, you, you won't mistake it for something else. Um, and it's here, uh, it's definitely in Essex and it's everywhere. Um, <laughs> and it uh, spreads by railroads, roads, right away, waterways. Waterways are the main path because it doesn't, um, hold well to the, the banks. So once it dominates a riparian area, as soon as you get like a heavy storm or a really strong rain event, it dislodges the plant and sends it further down the watershed. So that's really the predominant way that it's spreading. Um, and it is an Essex. Uh, and so I think we can be uh, watching it. Um, definitely don't want this plant anywhere near your, your house or anything that you want to uh, protect from its impacts. So those are the, uh, the watch list species. Um, obviously there's so many more invasives out there. It can be kind of overwhelming. And um, our website is a great spot to kind of go and take a look at some of the other um, high priority invasive species that uh, get some attention in Ontario. 
but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what happens when you do report an invasive species. I think sometimes citizen science can feel a little bit like, here's another report of another invasive species. And um, maybe maybe it can be, you wonder like if anything is being done with the, the information. And um, I just wanted to assure you that there, there is responses happening. Um, what what the big system that um, professionals in invasive species management use is EDMAPS and it's early detection and distribution mapping system is what it's called. It was made by the University of Georgia and um, Ontario right now has its own EDMAPS that was also made by them, but they're kind of syncing the two together right now. So there's going to be one master EDMAPS project for North America. Um, and it's a web-based system, but you can also download the app to a smartphone if you wanted. And uh, really, you just need a picture some, uh, and some in information on location. Uh, and uh, you can upload the information to EdMaps. iNaturalist works too, though. And I know that our club recently launched an iNaturalist project, and we've been encouraging members to report their uh, like observations of species into the iNat app. So, it does um, get used as well. Um, and it's a query. So EdMaps automatically pulls iNaturalist reports for specific high priority species. And um, a lot of the professionals in I, um, invasive species management have notification sets to come right to their emails for, from both EdMaps and iNaturalist. So these really high priority species like oak wilt if you were to think you saw oak wilt in Windsor or Essex County and you make a report to one of these systems, it ends up in the CFIA hands within an hour or two. Like they are watching for some of these highly aggressive species. Um, the other piece of this though, um, boom, my notes seem strange. I have like a spotted lanternfly notes on this slide. Um, okay, I want to, yeah, so those are the platforms we use to report invasive species, and what happens when you make that report is it is immediately loaded into the website, um, and it's made freely available to any land manager, scientist, researchers, landowner, educator, conservationist citizen scientists, forester, any government staff that wants to go online and look at the data. It appears immediately. Um, and these reports are triaged. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters runs the Ontario's Invading Species Awareness Program, and they are on the other side of this, and they triage um, reports. They also look at the pictures and confirm um, and do some of that work. And um, they have this flow chart that they set up with the CFIA, the MNR, and other agencies that want to hear from them if certain species arrive. And they use that flow chart. And if so, if something comes in that's a high priority, like the oak wilt, um, they would be immediately notified. So organizations kind of what you would call submit a watch list to the OFH and they and they do those, they follow that, that system. Um, and it kind of just depends um policies and like the CFIA, the MNR, they have these um policies that guide what species are high priority. And they have maps that create um containment areas. So it's kind of like if um uh, what's the example? If water soldier was reported in the Trent water system by a citizen scientist not really going to gain a lot of interest because we know it's already there. They're already working in that area. But if Water Soldier was suddenly reported in Kenora, that's a problem. And they would respond to that immediately because they're trying to contain that species. Um, and then same with like Oakwell, if it was reported, it's the first time it gets showed up in Ontario, that's an immediate reaction, right? So it, it just depends on the other side where that species is being reported from, like what geographic area and what level of priority it requires in response. Um, 
hopefully that makes sense. Um, and here's a slide on some of the people on the other side. Um, and, and really you, you get what's called a collaborative approach for many of the um, invasive species uh, coming into Ontario. The CFIA has the Plant Protection and Import Regulations Act. Um, and this prevents new species and they have um, permits for importing specific things. Uh, the MNR has the Invasive Species Act, which I, I threw some slides in at the end if we had time to just show you some of the species that are listed already and some that are, are newly listed. Um, but it's really about preventing, detecting, and responding to invasive species. OMAFRA is the noxious weed list, which we're, we're most of us hopefully familiar with. It's been around a long time, but it's to protect agriculture. Um, they had milkweed on that list for many years, and that's been removed to protect the, the, the butterflies. So um, that, that weed act kind of moves into, um, you know, every county has a, a weed inspector and they go out and, and remove these species that are considered noxious weeds. Um, so there's a tool there that, you know, an invasive plant could potentially be added to the noxious weed list and managed like that. Um, doesn't happen often. Municipalities and CAs have a role too. They, they spend money on education and awareness. Uh, municipal bylaws are good examples. Um, the Invasive Species Center does a lot of work uh, helping with um, management control, education, and then you have a handful of other nonprofits and grassroots groups like um, our club. Um, as we get our, our Phragmites program up and running, um, we, we then play a role in the approach and the um, response to invasive species in Ontario. And if anything, if you know you put in your response or you put in an observation and um, nothing yet happens, at least it's going into one place. And the power of data all stored in the same place is, is really strong as you saw in some of those maps. Um, the citizen scientists uh, are helping create those maps and it really does support um, a number of things. Uh, range knowledge uh, increases the likelihood of successful prevention containment. And it also helps to notify professionals of where updates to regulations for both species and areas might be. Um, and it makes the data really accessible uh, for across a number of uh, professionals that might need to use that. So, and other things that we could do as a club, um, just reducing those pathways of spread, going back to the beginning of the presentation there where, you know, if we can intercept the movement of these species, it's, it's one of the best ways that we as residents and club members can, can really help uh, contain the spread. Um, so some of the options on the slide there, and then, you know, just sharing your knowledge, talking to some people about, about what you know about invasive species. Um, and then this slide here, um, I mentioned the FRAG committee that um, we've started here at the club and there's Heather's email. Um, if you'd like some more information, please get a hold of her. Um, it's also went out in one of the member emails. So if uh, you can't write this down right now or you need to look it up later, um, check the history of member emails and um, her contact information will be in there. And then uh, the last thing is, you know, managing invasive species if you can. Um, it's a long haul when you go after some of these plants, it can take, you know, years to bring the infestation under control, but it doesn't mean it's not worth it, especially if you have property and you're trying to uh, protect your land from the impacts of these plants and, and species. Um, our website has a database of best management practices. So I encourage you to go take a look and, um, you know, contact the ISC with questions. Um, we don't always have the expertise in house, but we always know who does and can connect you to, to people across the province who would be able to help you. And then finally, uh, I think I mentioned already too that our site has a <clears throat> species profiles um, for many other invasive species that are um, in Ontario or, or coming. Um, so there's my question slide. I wanted to put this reference slide up in case anybody wanted to dig into some of the data or um, 
you know, results that I spoke about tonight. And then uh, just quickly, I put these up because I think it's important to know what is and isn't listed in Ontario. Um, we do have this Invasive Species Act. It does have prohibited and restricted species. Um, it's meant to kind of help reduce the spread. And then here's the, the list that are um, prohibited and restricted. Um, and, you know, happy to see things like Phragmites on this list, um, European water chestnut water soldier, many of the species I mentioned tonight are actually restricted um, or pro prohibited. And what that means is um, you're just not allowed to import, possess, deposit, release, transport, breed, grow, buy, sell, lease, or trade. And restricted is every of those things except you can, you, you can uh, move them around and possess them. Um, so, and that's uh, implemented by the MNR, MDNRF. They have also introduced a uh, water pathway regulation requesting small boats and, paddle and um, manual boats, I guess, um, recreational boats to follow this clean drain dry regulation starting this year. So that should be really helpful for reducing the spread of aquatic invasive species and um, exciting news from Ontario kind of putting up a, a fight to stop some of the spread of these, these plants. So that's all I have tonight and uh, encouraging everyone to kind of unmute themselves and let's have a discussion. I know um, it can be a lot of information and hope I shared something new or inspired you to look deeper into the invasive species world. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, we'll just open it up to questions now. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question or add it to the chat, uh, Karen, I'd love to help out. Um, I can't see myself here on uh, on uh, the camera, but I'm interested in uh, last time you talked about Phragmitis in uh, we weren't able to use the uh, herbicide, mm -hmm. that, right? Like, um, yeah, I mean, it might've been newly registered, actually. I can't remember, I talked last year, but it, it was probably coming. I think they registered it late in the summer or in the middle of the summer. And um, it was available for purchase um, in the 2020 control season, but it was, they didn't have a lot of it. So it got kind of bought up by uh, land managers and um, yeah. So but, yeah. Uh, I, it's been discouraging in the um, Spring Garden Nancy to see the uh, pond there that is totally, like I would say 70% overtaken by Phragmitis again after you have gone in, I don't know how many years ago, maybe four or five years ago, you went in with a, amphibian machine and cleared it and it's been so lovely to see all the wildlife come back in that pond and now it's just being taken over again by phragmitis well that's on that's um not an uncommon story with phragmites and um i'm sorry to hear that i haven't been to spring garden um since i think the fall last year so i'll have to go and take a look myself but um I think uh, the amphibious machine, I, I, I believe what they were trying to do with that site is remove most of the biomass, then go in and spray it later. Um, so I think um, I could try to get more information on that project, but I don't think they're giving up if that's a concern. I think they're gonna keep trying. And um, one of the things about Frag that is incredibly frustrating is you're not just killing the above ground, like you, you're, you're putting in the time and energy to kill the underground root system. And when you get infestations the size of Spring Garden and um, in some of the other places in Essex, those underground root networks are enormous and it can take years to deplete the resources and really get rid of it. Um, and that's why our FRAG committee is trying to say align to some of these projects and say, the resources required to keep this species gone after it has been removed, um, we can go in and try to help kind of keep the species controlled so that 
municipalities like the city of Windsor can move on from these sites and keep controlling it. And that, you know, that's our idea anyway. We're just getting started. And I think um, hopefully we can help some of those projects like Spring Garden um, and keep it, keep it under control. Great. Are there any other questions out there? Oh, I just wondered, um, the Invasive Species Center, so yeah. does, does it do direct field work, like uh, attempts at removal or management, or does it mostly do kind of education and linking up partners and stuff like that? The latter, yeah, we are um, more of a knowledge transfer connector, <laughs> um, program manager. We do a lot of um, collaborative facilitation um, we go after money to do work on the ground, but we tend to transfer the money to third parties um, right. and get that, to get that work done. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you had mentioned going in by canoe somewhere. Oh, you know, that, so yeah, that, that was a one-off project, apparently. I had just started with the ISB, and the first thing they told me was, go canoe the Welland River. And I'm thinking like, wow, okay, <laughs> this sounds fun. Yeah. But apparently that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> So do you, did you say there in Sault Ste. Marie? Is that what you said? Yeah. But you work for them th uh, from your home. Um, That's so. right. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, the offices are in the NR Canada building up in Sault Ste. Marie. So um, it's a federal building, I guess. And um, we do have a lab there, apparently. I got to get up there at some point. Um, I haven't been able to travel there. We tried to do a staff conference. Um, but it got canceled because of uh, COVID. And um, anyway, they they have a lab. There's one of our employees does um, diagnostics for the forestry industry. Um, they he does work with uh, insects. So I'm learning about that branch of the ISC. But there there's information on our website. Thanks. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really discouraging to see. Um, I'm a kayaker, so you can't see um, the land at all. You don't even know anything because all you see is fragments around you when you yeah. go small rivers. Oh, I understand. I uh, moved to Essex County in 2018, and um, I still get bothered by the frag. <laughs> it's, it's extensive here, and um, you know. It's a big problem, but you know what they say about big problems, you gotta start somewhere, right? And um, I hope, and, and we hope, like Heather, Aileen, myself, the board, people, we, I think we, we can start with some education, right? And um, potentially help people along the river. Um, river Canard comes to mind, because I think I went, I went kayaking there a couple of times myself. And you know, it's little fringe for egg in some places with, at the edge of people's properties. and. It wouldn't take much to go out there with a cane cutter or a still hedge trimmer that are working. These tools are working in other places and just bring it down. Um, and it's just a repeat control and then getting everybody to do it. But it's it's a place that you could start at least educating those who have an interest in potentially getting it out of their way. It's a lot of work because there's uh, people on yeah. Snake Lane that do it already, but it's mm -hmm. just constantly they have to keep after it. Yeah, it is. Um, I guess I'll give you a bit of encouragement. Um, my previous position with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, that organization um, aligned with um, some of the hunt clubs and some of the partners mm -hmm. in Norfolk County and have managed, oh gosh, I don't know where they're at now, but um, two years ago, they had done 1,100 hectares of frag mighty controlled in the Long Point wetlands. So these large scale frag control programs are possible. It's just a matter of aligning the right people, getting the right money in place and investment, and, and it can happen. Like the tools in, are in Ontario. It just, you got to get the right momentum and the right people at the table. That brings to mind, has there been any cutbacks in uh, funding from the Ontario government in the last, with this, this government? 
Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, there's been regular grants available. Um, and then, you know, some of the larger nonprofit tab development teams that focus on fundraising for projects like that, right? So they bring in private donor dollars to match some of the government work and, and you can really scale up in those situations. Um, for us, I think, you know, if we can start with some um, education, um, teach some of our members some of the techniques that uh, are working in the new BMPs and then um, potentially help with the Snake Road project. Um, I, like, I understand what you mean when you invest a bunch of money, you see frag gone from a specific area and then, then what? Like, how do you keep it gone and, and then continue to expand those efforts? And, and that's, that's maybe where we could potentially help as well. You look like you're thinking. <laughs> and just, a, just a side note on, on our club. Um, this is Aileen Petrosi. I'm, I'm uh, the FRAG uh, committee member. Um, we're looking for to, to get some, just a, some, some cane cutters, get volunteers. We're gonna partner, we're hoping to partner um, with a landowner or spring gardens and, and get this started hopefully in, in the spring sometimes, you know, so if you are interested, please contact Heather um, and uh, let us know because we're gonna need just, if, we, if we're gonna take care of something, we're gonna have to update it. We're have, gonna have to do it every year to mm -hmm. keep it under control. It's not, and if we can get maybe spring gardens, if we can go with Ojibwe and, and help them out or anything like that. So um, keep in mind, we're gonna, we're gonna have, we're gonna look for grants to buy equipment, um, waiters. Um, so we can do this on a, on a annual basis. Just like um, I think there's one member that does um, mustard out in, uh, uh, Leamington. She does it every year. She gather, gathers volunteers. So I'm hoping that this will be a, just a start that we can we can uh, do this every year. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think Ian has his hand up. Yes. Could you confirm for me if there are wild hogs in Essex County? <laughs> Not in Essex yet. Um, they have been listed uh, as a restricted species. I think not yet detected in on or confirmed in Ontario. I'd have to look that one up, Ian. Um, I didn't read up on that one before tonight, but they're um, a priority species for sure. I think they're they're bad out west, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But um, in Ontario, they created some uh, pretty strong policies to uh, ensure that one doesn't take off here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It got listed, uh, I think it was restricted. Um, let's check that slide. I, I was wondering about the hogs as well. I was wondering if they, if like, do they qualify as invasive? Yeah. Do they, well, yeah, I mean, did they come in from somewhere else? Because it includes domestic hogs that are escapes, right? I think so. That one I didn't do. I haven't done a lot of reading on that one yet. I know that the legislation, I think what I did read is they are working with hog farms to ensure they don't escape. This is one of the pieces of the legislation. Um, but I do think they can come from other places too. And, and I, they, um, they're they not native to our local systems, right? Like a wild pig, they're they're just not meant to live here naturally. I so see. They, they get out and they have um, significant impacts, like voracious appetites, and they dig up, you know, they dig up, um, they dig for for insects and roots, and they just decimate. Mm -hmm. um, they're also a really huge threat to um, corn and uh, agriculture, so they would qualify as a and yeah. yeah, it was the indigenous nature of them or, or not that I wasn't sure of, but you know, mm -hmm. don't know where they came from. Yeah, I think they're, gosh, where are wild pigs? Like, where are pigs native? The cells? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But like, obviously, we've been farming them for 
very, very long time. So domestic, but still able to escape and, and have uh, impacts to eco ecosystems. Yeah, a lot of the prohibited ones you'll see are um, aquatic invasive species, which didn't really talk so much tonight, but I, and I just, I did that by design because I think the opportunity for us to see aquatic invasives is much less than what we might see on the land. So, but there's uh, profiles of all these species on our website, if you're interested in uh, reading up more about them, including the wild pig. Well, it's scary and very interesting at the same time. <laughs> it's just, it's overwhelming. It yeah. is. It is, and um, I think the one of the reports I've read recently suggests that invasive species, the, like the economic impacts, are tripling every decade because of uh, how many species are moving around. Um, so that that's concerning, and I think. But what I think we can take out as positives is, you know, there is action, there is attention. Um, the lesson has been learned. You know, we have things like zebra mussel established, frag mites established, quagga mussel, um, round goby, like these species came in and established and caused significant impacts and people don't forget that, um, emerald ash borer. Um, and the an emerald ash borer still costing municipalities money to, to manage the impacts and the dead the dead biomass. So knowing that and, and having learned those lessons and having that um, knowledge base to work with, there's growing interest in prevention and rapid response um, programs. Um, there's more interest in municipal level, particularly in invasive species strategies. Um, you know, our own city of Windsor is, is proceeding with a Phragmites control plan and, and strategy. So, you know, there, there's action happening as scatters as it might be. <laughs> there's more and more investment because the, the message is getting through that prevention is cheaper than that long-term control piece. So I think we can, you know, I know it's kind of scary and, you know, a lot to take in, but you know, the best way we can help is, is report anything we see out there and um, encourage control uh, and encourage our, our leaders locally to, to take action. Like my mother would say, a stitch in time saves nine. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing here. And yeah, um, we do a lot of pathway analysis at ISC, I guess. Um, I haven't really dug into that part of what we do yet, but I hear about these analyses that we do and those can be really useful where, you know, if you look at some of these species, you know, how are they moving around and how are they likely to arrive in Ontario? Um, those, that information is, is really helpful when they start uh, funding programs and developing response efforts to know, you know, where do you focus your efforts it can be really helpful too. Um, sorry, there's a couple questions in the chat here. Um, where is the invasive? Okay, I, it's in Sault Ste. Marie, um, and it's funded multiple ways. Um, we are uh, strongly associated, a lot of our funding comes from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, or Northern Development and Mines now is in there. Um, so they, they work with us really closely. Um, the Invasive Species Act is under their mandate in Ontario. So a lot of the programs they fund to implement that mandate uh, comes through the mm -hmm. ISC. Um, we also get a lot of funding from grants, uh, just uh, from various government grants um, and foundations, um, just like any nonprofit. Um, and we operate with donations as well. All right, I'm not seeing anything else or hearing anybody. So I just want to say thank you, Karen, for taking the time with a lot of information there. That's uh, mm -hmm. interesting to see <laughs> what uh, I didn't know the list was going to be so long, actually. Um, 
you know, what we need to look out for or what's here. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of great information. Thank you for uh, taking the time and taking everybody through this. Um, thank you everybody for joining on the call tonight and we will see you in the next meeting. Yeah. Take care. Thanks everyone. Um, hopefully see you in person sometime soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. It was great. Take um, care. Have a good night. Yeah, you Bye. Too. Bye everyone.